All right, everyone, it's uh, time for some Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking down to Miami tonight. Got uh, Dwayne Holloway on the line, uh, the wholesome one. You can catch his YouTube channel right here. Just look it up, uh, the wholesome one. Dwayne, how you doing tonight? I'm doing wonderful, man. God is good, so let's Absolutely, get he is. Would like uh, everyone to know to like, comment, and subscribe. So... I would recommend and encourage you to like it, even if you don't agree with us. If you think we're bringing forth uh, quality college football discussion, debate, and analysis, then uh, give us a like. And even if you disagree, that's where the comments come into play. And definitely, I love the discussion that uh, you guys bring. We've got a number of people on the live chat already, and certainly we will have many more jumping on board here in the next few minutes. I hope these live streams work for everyone. And as I announced it yesterday, going forward, starting the week of July 15th, we will have a live stream at 4 o'clock Eastern on Sunday, 6 o'clock Eastern on Monday, Wednesday and Thursday night at 7 o'clock Eastern. And then I tend to pop up with some other live streams that are a bit impromptu throughout the week because I just can't help myself. All right, Dwayne, let's talk to Miami football. A uh, one night. Uh, Cameron Davis uh, out of Miami Carroll, a running back, a seventh rated uh, player at that position, according to 247 Sports. Uh, he's in the fold. He's all signed and delivered and and ready to roll and on campus. Yes, he is. Uh, we're very excited. He was the last player uh, in the recruiting class of 2018 to be able to make it in. And uh, we've actually, this is out of the last four years, the uh, one of the only times we were able to get everybody in by the beginning of session uh, of summer B session. So, um, you know, Mark Rick is really cleaning up the academic side of things also getting guys in. All right. We got the wholesome one on to talk to Miami football on a Tuesday night uh, live stream. And again, uh, we ask that you subscribe, like, and comment. And we've got a number of people here on the live chat and anything you've got, uh, by way of questions or comments, I will pass them along to the wholesome one. And if it's not Miami football, I will take it on as well. So this is uh, kind of the, one of the typical topics uh, during the offseason, uh, Dwayne, is in regards to people talk breakout players. They talk who are going to be the key players for the next season. And you hear the term again, breakout players. Right. For me? You know, that's a guy that uh, might be playing already, might be a guy that's um, – somebody who's already pretty significant in the starting lineup, but they're ready to take that next step and be a star, a national star. Or maybe it's somebody that uh, we have yet to see play much, except maybe some special teams, and uh, they need to fill a void. They need to become an impact player. So yeah. kind of different levels there. But uh, in regards to breakout players for this Miami team, to be at the end of the season where you want to be, who do you think is going to play a key role? Well, I got a guy uh, in my defensive fronts, uh, Gerald Willis, Gerald Willis III. He's a guy who was a former five-star recruit, um, played at University of Florida, and I talked about this in one of my videos. Uh, go check that out on uh, my D-line preview. He, uh, at Florida, he had a lot of on and off the field issues. Uh, and uh, Jameis Winston is actually running. They were playing, actually, they were playing Florida State. And Jameis Winston runs to the sideline. Mind you, Gerald Willis is on the sideline and just checks him right in the mouth. Now, you know, me being an old school Canes fan, I kind of liked it, but it was stupid if you're a Gator fan. But um, bringing a guy with that mentality and that aggression to, to Miami is what we needed. But he's kind of put that – behind him and now he's 100 percent focused on football uh, took off some time this past year with some personal issues and got that all handled i don't know what it is i don't ask questions like that i appreciate him for being able to take time and handle those situations and now uh mark rick and manny diaz they rave and a new defensive line coach coach Simms, uh, simmons they rave about how this guy has really turned the corner not only as a person and a man, but as a football player and a consistent dominant mindset that he brings to everyday practice. Um, you know, Nick Saban says, you know, perfect practice makes us perfect. And a guy practicing dominance every day is the person who I'm putting all of them. If I had to push all my eggs in one basket, I'm putting it on Gerald Willis III uh, defensively. 
Um, another guy who I think is going to take another big step, I'll tell you two on offense and I'll do two on defense, is um, Demetrius Jackson. Demetrius Jackson was number 31 for us. Uh, DJX was a basketball player actually in high school and played one year of organized football and turned into a four-star recruit playing opposite of Chad Thomas. Uh, but this is a guy who, if you saw him play, you wouldn't think he was a basketball player because he plays with such aggression in his hands and his, in his leverage at about six foot three, uh, six, three and a half. But he led the teams in TFLs and sacks before he got hurt in the Virginia Tech game. Uh, and this is a guy who is a red shirt senior, also just like Gerald Willis the third. And uh, I think he's ready to turn the corner, especially come off that edge for us. Uh, I'm hoping he starts, but I think Jonathan Garvin is just too good not to start him and Joe Jackson. So um, Demetrius Jackson and Gerald Willis will be my two defensive guys uh, for our breakout this year. Hey, Dwayne, had somebody comment on a chat that we did with Miami football a couple of days ago that uh, they were a bit put off, a bit offended that Joe Jackson, and I believe it was, um, I'm trying to think who else it was on defense that they uh, thought should have been a first-team All-American in the preseason uh, uh, All-American uh, polls. Uh, I don't know if you gave those a look, if you put any stock in that. I typically <laughs> don't. It's before the season. It's a preseason All-America list. Wow. It's expected – in terms of what people are going to do, but uh, you'd rather have those guys on the postseason All-America team. Exactly, exactly. They might have been talking about Shaq Quarterman. I know he got – may have been second or not even put on there, honestly. Um, but, no, I don't put a lot of weight into those things um, because I know I've seen plenty of guys get all those accolades and then postseason come around, uh, the honorable mention guys. You don't want your – your best players being honorable mention. Um, but I know for a fact Joe Jackson did get snubbed. Um, but, you know, when you speak that Clemson defensive line, it's usually kind of tough to get up there with those guys. Yeah, no doubt. So uh, Clemson uh, not only had, as I've mentioned a few times on here, according to Sports Illustrated, if you put stock in Sports Illustrated, I think their rankings were a bit off with a few players, but they released their top 100 players. Mm -hmm. and, and Clemson's defensive front was so well thought of. Now think about this. If they would have put three of the top players as defensive linemen, let's say they considered Clemson had three of the top 10 defensive linemen, that would be sheer dominance. But they said three of the top 10 players in the country, regardless of position, regardless of position <laughs> at Clemson. Uh, yeah. Dexter Lawrence and Christian Wilkins and on yeah, down no, the line. Austin Bryant. Um, Absolutely. Um, looking at the um, situation here. Yeah. Gerald Willis. So uh, we did a, uh, a bit of a feature on him with Cam Underwood from state of the U uh, mm -hmm. who was all excited about Gerald Willis coming on the scene. And uh, I'm looking at uh, Demetrius Jackson's performance and some of his production. I think it was Michael Jackson, actually, that somebody had commented on the live chat the other night about him not making the first team uh, or any of the uh, first or second teams, third teams, All-American wow. uh, this year. Wow. He, wow. Mike Jack didn't make any of the... Oh, uh, that's, I'll that's... have to give that a look and verify that. And again, <laughs> there's a zillion All-American teams. So which one is anyone talking about in particular? Mm -hmm. Demetrius Jackson only had 18 tackles last year, but boy, he made those things count. Seven and a half tackles for loss and three and a half sacks. So mm -hmm. most of those tackles were disruptive plays in the opponent's backfield. Also had uh, an interception as well. So very productive season for him. Uh, we will let uh, Dwayne chime in on his breakout players on offense. Then I'm going to go to the live chat and serve up some comments and questions. What do you got, Dwayne? All righty. Uh, this young man, I think, is kind of a no-brainer for a breakout on offense because he didn't really get an opportunity with Malik Rozier's inconsistencies to get the ball in open field and make the big plays. And I think you might have an idea of who I'm talking about. Short, speedy wide receiver, Jeff Thomas, number four for us. This guy um, reminds me of a Philip Dorsett as far as he is lightning in a bottle. 
And we were lucky to get him. I mean, because he was he was basically Louisville's guy, but he chose us and we appreciate that. Um, and you know, shout out to Ron Dugans and what he's doing with the wide receivers. But one thing about Jeff Thomas is this guy is out here blocking as if he's a tight end. He's running routes like a wide receiver and at any moment could catch a bomb and take it to the house. Um, his route running is is precise. His hands were actually very well for a freshman because you and I both know that can be a either you're immaculate at it or maybe you you know you're dropping every pass that comes your way or every other pass that comes your way uh, as a freshman. But I think he has been working so hard to be able to show that there's a reason why he was a top five wide receiver in the country coming out of high school. And he wants to show up in big games. And just like we had an opportunity to put DJ Dallas in open space and, you know, the Wildcat and things of that nature to get him the ball, I think we're going to also do the same thing with Jeff Thomas. Even if it's the old Stacey Coley screens that we used to do just to get that guy in dynamic open space with our athletic offensive lineman out there getting on uh, DBs and linebackers. So that's that's the guy um, that I'm pointing to as a wide receiver. Now, let's take it to the big nasties up front. I think that Navon Donaldson is my other breakout player for this upcoming year. Now, a young man from Miami Central, he's about six foot five, six six. He was 380 pounds when he came here uh, as a early enrollee. Lost over 35 pounds in a three month span. Shows me a young man who cares about this sport and understanding that you have to be in shape and you have to look the part. And that's a that's a part of it. Now he played right guard. He's moving to right tackle, and. I mean, he should have been a freshman All-American. This guy came in from day one moving people, which is something we haven't had here on the offensive line since about 2014 uh, when Eric Flowers was a great college lineman. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Navon Donaldson is a young man who I see the work ethic. And one thing about offensive line, if you don't hear about them, that's a great thing. Now, if you do hear about them, that means that either moving people out of the way or he got a holding penalty, which he didn't get any holding penalties last year. Um, and until he got hurt late in that uh, Florida State game, he was doing very well and was playing at a high level. So that would be my other breakout uh, player. i give you Jeff Thomas and Von Donaldson. Yeah, Dwayne, sometimes you see those plays where the, the quarterback gets flattened from uh, his backside, and then about two seconds later, you see the offensive lineman who's uh, who's uh, to blame kind of standing over the quarterback. He's the first one to help him up because he just got whipped, and then he turns around, and he's just kind of standing there like a... Uh, ah, sorry about yeah. that, bud. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Navon Donaldson's a guy that, uh, according to the 247 composite, coming into... Uh, uh, College football was the 11th rated offensive tackle out of high school, mm -hmm. uh, top 13 player in Florida, number 72 overall recruit. So, of course, we know the Florida uh, national ratio where they've got 13 of the top 72 players right there in Florida, and that's what he was last season. Jeff Thomas caught 17 for 374. So if we do the quick math, we know 17, 340, that's 20 yards a catch. So he's way over 20 yards per catch. And he had mm -hmm. the two touchdowns, uh, one in the Syracuse game, uh, in mm -hmm. which was a close game. Uh, the Cuse coming off that big win against Clemson, went down to Miami and gave you guys a fight, and, and that was a big touchdown in that game in a one-score game. And then right out of the gate after a very sluggish first half uh, offensively at Chapel Hill against North Carolina, Jeff Thomas just phew, lost the entire defense and nobody could catch him, and uh, that was a big bomb play to get you guys uh, – generated with some offense uh, early in the second half. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I personally think he should have had, if not three, uh, there are two particular plays that I look back to uh, against Notre Dame. I usually say Notre Lame, but I'm I know where the that. other one's coming, but keep going. <laughs> he had a nice, uh, I want to say that was either a hitch or, or a curl or comeback or something. And, uh, he catches it, you know, he was out of bounds. I'm not going to say he wasn't out of bounds, but that was nice to see him 
A, the route running that I spoke about, the hands, and being in open field. Then also against Georgia Tech, this guy gets a, a bomb and he's jogging because he's so used to being faster than everyone else. Uh, you know, he gets tackled at the four yard line. I think we stall out and get a field goal as opposed to a touchdown because, you know, we, uh, <laughs> we're not too good in that red zone, but we're working on it. You know, Dwayne, I thought you were going to bring up the ACC championship game, wasn't it? Jeff Thomas, they get behind the defense and uh, Rozier missed him. We try not to bring up that game. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, uh, we could talk about it. Um, though games like that, especially in an ACC championship game, um, we're not going to get that call. I understand it was. It, I personally thought it was PI, but we're, we're not going to get that call. It's two two top ten teams. Let the kids play. Uh, let them go at it. Uh, yeah, if Malik Rozier throws that on a on a seam or he throws it right then that's a touchdown and maybe we're in the game. But uh, in actuality, if we go uh, player by player, just like you alluded to before the game, you said, well, if everything goes right, Miami could win, but Clemson was just a better team, better program at this time. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of my thoughts on that one there. Talking Miami football with Dwayne Holloway. He is the Wholesome One Catches YouTube channel right here. And again, it's the Wholesome One Miami football analysis uh, on a regular basis right there with Dwayne. I'm glad that we connected on here and uh, had him on a few times to talk at Canes. And we know that you guys can't get enough of Miami football. Uh, I am looking at the live chat, unfortunately, about the first, I don't know how many, uh, 50, 100 comments wiped out. So I, I've never seen it do this. I've scrolled to the top and all the comments that I was looking at before are gone. So it's starting about halfway through the chat. Uh, the first one I see here is from Ben Pratt, uh, uh, somebody that I've never seen comment here. So, Ben, welcome to Mark Rogers TV, uh, who has checked out your videos, Dwayne, and says, keep up the great work. So that's good to hear always. Thanks. Eric Tufts on the line as well. Country boy looking for all canes. Uh, you got a few detractors out there, of course. Uh, Laurence Guider. I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, is for some reason uh, enjoying uh, the matchup that he saw in the Orange Bowl and would like to see that be a regular game. I don't <laughs> necessarily know that Wisconsin and Miami are going to hook up for regular non-conference games. Uh, yeah, Jeff Thomas. People love Jeff Thomas. Uh, let's see what else we have here. We've got, uh, I know that somebody wanted to comment about Amon Richards and get your take about him possibly having a huge season. Uh, okay. Uh, Amon Richards, to me, um, is dynamic as they come. I mean, just, just like I spoke about in my top five wide receivers over the last decade, go check that out on my channel. Um, we are Miami. We're South Florida. We're, we're going to get these amazing open field guys, you know, wide receiver types. But Amon Richards might actually be the best complete wide receiver we've had in a very, very long time. And I think he's not only motivated to for the National Football League, but he's motivated that he had almost, I want to say, 500 all-purpose, if not 600. Uh, I might be off on that one. Uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, on a hamstring, on a bad hamstring last year. And then eventually he uh, had the ACL injury, so he wasn't able to play in the Clemson game. But he is a dynamic player that defensive coordinators have to be prepared for. Because even with a hampered hamstring, he still made big plays against Florida State. He scored against Duke. Um, he had a couple of big catches against Virginia Tech. He had a pretty good, big uh, reception deep down the field against Virginia Tech that could have been a touchdown if, you know, Malik throws that a little further, but it's neither here nor there. And I think he can be our next 1,000 to 1,200-yard wide receiver um, this upcoming season. The only thing that I could see that being an issue is we have so many other dynamic guys. I don't know if we'll be able to get him to 1,000 spreading the ball with all of our athletes, but he would be my 1,000-yard uh, or more guy. So we've got Miami Love coming from uh, Airbrush Royale, Jeremy Halton, and Custom Paint, who says uh, love the uh, 
uh, Miami coverage. And of course, we'll keep it up right here at Mark Rogers TV. And of course, uh, we cover all of college football. You go to Dwayne's channel there, channel there at the Wholesome One, the Wholesome One, and uh, you uh, get all your Miami fill right there. Uh, let's see. Country Boy wants to ask about uh, Perry and how his development is coming along. Okay. Nicosi. My, oh, go ahead. What'd you say? Just a uh, meaning Nicosi, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Nicosi Perry. Uh, from my insight or from the people who I speak to, uh, Nicosi is doing well. It's going to be a battle. It's definitely going to be. Uh, Jared Williams is actually in. Jared Williams is in this battle. There's going to be a dog fight to the end between uh, those three until, um, you know, Malik is, it is, it is Malik's job to lose. Uh, Nikosi has to make the plays that need to be made in practice in order for coach Mark Rick to trust him in game. That's any coach. That's any, you know, relationship. There has to be a trust factor in there. Uh, just like I spoke about last week when we were on here, if you ask me a guy who can take us to the national championship or win the big games in blowout fashion like we could, it's Nikosi Perry. If you ask me a guy who I'll trust for 11 games to in my 11-1 and one season, like I was speaking about before, it's Malik Rozier with that defense that we have. But Nikosi Perry is doing better. He's getting the grasp of the playbook, but he's also learning where to uh, – where to throw the ball against certain coverages and little things that you need to learn uh, as a quarterback in college football. We've got uh, Seth Hankins on the line. Uh, Seth, good to see you right here. Want some Gators talk and we will uh, accommodate you, Seth. Don't worry about it. We'll get to it. Uh, our guy, Brandon Cooper, who's been on the show from college football vids. Uh, he's got his thumbs up for the wholesome one right here. Happy to see hey. you on the show. Appreciate that, Brandon. Of course, uh, Donovan Robinson, our guy talking LSU football all the time on here. So, man, I got to tell you, wholesome one, we, we got to get past this LSU Miami game. I can't wait to see these athletes on the field together, knocking heads, getting after it. But I am, I've, I don't know what we're going to be talking about after this game because, uh, the, this chat gets just jammed up with LSU and Miami trash talk. Uh huh. Now, well, Let's let's actually speak about how the Mark Rick effect has been on our program. Do you think this would have been the way it was if LSU and Miami, which Al Golden declined originally, we were supposed to play them in 2015, I believe, when Wisconsin played in the uh, Green Bay Packers. They played LSU. Wisconsin and LSU played each other in uh, the Packers' home uh, field that was supposed to be Miami LSU, but Al Golden declined and said that our program wasn't to that level yet. So seeing a guy Mark Rick come in and be able to build us to uh, we were always relevant as Cam Underwood says, but a top fifteen program now rises to stakes to where we can have these debates back and forth and it actually means something uh, to talk with LSU and be able to. Uh, kind of be on the same level, if not above them right now, that I personally think our program is a little further ahead than they are, um, with my unbiased opinion. <laughs> but uh, I think it's going to be a great game. Some Kansas fans, they think we're going to blow them out. And some LSU people say, oh, well, they're the ACC, we're the SEC, and we're LSU. Uh, and Miami isn't Miami as they used to be. It was just what some of them say. But if you go player by player, position by position, and coaching has a big effect on these things, I believe it'll be somewhere in that 21 to 17, maybe 10 to 14 type games to where it's a thriller. And, you know, regardless of who wins, we'll be talking about that game for a couple of weeks, if not years uh, after it, because of how much talent would have been on the field. I mean, think about this guy, uh, the, one of the best corners, Greedy Williams, is going up against Amon Richards. These are top 15 NFL draft picks or top 20 going at it in an opening game. Who wouldn't love to see something like that? So, of course, uh, another guy that made some huge plays for you last year in the passing game was Daryl Langham. Not a ton of plays, but he made two huge ones, obviously, against Florida State and then the fourth down conversion against Georgia Tech with the game in the balance. And if he wouldn't have snagged off 
uh, that uh, juggling reception there along the right sideline, you would have dropped another game. Uh, somebody commenting here on the chat that uh, he needs more touches. He does need more touches. This is a guy, you know, um, Legend Langham is what we call him in the, in the Canes family. This guy, they usually put him in and out with um, 18, Lawrence Cager, uh, as our big wide receiver. And we actually tried to get him to move to tight end. And he refused to move to tight end, and he actually has made some plays as a wide receiver. So uh, we're, we're not as mad about that as we used to be. But, uh, I mean, this guy's like 6'5", 235, you know, playing wide receiver. But he makes he made some big plays, and I think he is a confidence player. Everyone's a confidence person, but he is a guy to where if he gets a couple of catches and he gets going, and if the ball is up, you know, where the kids can't get to it, that's a Madden reference, <laughs> throwing it up to a tall wide receiver, then um, he's one of the best wide receivers on our team. So, uh, and I think he would be a great red zone threat with him and Cager out wide and, uh, you know, throw a fade route on each side and see what happens. So, yes, I do agree that he needs a couple more touches a game, five to six, I would say. So, Dwayne, to your point, you just mentioned four wide receivers in Richards and Thomas and then Cager and Langham, and that's why they're not going to put up a uh, video game kind of stats on a regular basis. You're going to see one guy have a huge game one week and the other guys just kind of chip in with th three catches for 45 and those kind of games. And then somebody else is going to break out another week. And when it's all said and done, you're not going to have like big 12 or mountain West wide receiver kind of stats where guys are uh, ripping defenses for 95 catches for 1500 yards. You're going to see a lot of those 40 and 50 catch guys for, you know, six, 800 yards receiving. Obviously, Amon Richards would be the candidate to do a little bit better than that. Jeff Thomas, as we discussed off the top, uh, going to be the guy that's going to have the yards per catch that's just astronomical. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, also, Michael Irvin being talked about at tight end. Uh, your thoughts about him uh, coming in here? I want to give props to uh, that dude, Smooch, talking Michael Irvin. All right, Michael Irvin, uh, the second. Uh, hmm. I have actually, I was very, very critical, very critical of him uh, on my channel, which I think uh, as an athlete in the public eye, you're open to criticism. So are me and you uh, with, what I, with what we say in our takes. Um, but there has to be something about this guy's job basically being – taken away from him by two freshmen who are coming in, you know, Brevin Jordan and Will Mallory uh, coming in and these guys are getting all the praise. If I were him, especially with the ped pedigree that he has, with his dad being a playmaker, this guy's mindset has to be, you know, uh, might be a killer mindset going into the, uh, the, the camp, you know, because he's the older guy. I believe he's a red shirt junior now. I believe that's where he is. Um, if not, just a flat out junior. And I think it's time for him to really show up and make some big plays. Uh, there will be opportunities. I know for a fact that Coach Mark Rick is going to give him an opportunity to show up. And um, it's Brevin Jordan's job to take, but yet and still is Michael Irvin's job to lose. Michael Irvin the second's job to lose. So that's a guy who I root for. I want to see him do good, but he may not be on that level of Brevin Jordan. Got uh, Dwayne Holloway on the line. He is the wholesome one talking Miami football. Please join his YouTube channel and subscribe right there for Miami football coverage. And of course, uh, Dwayne's joined us uh, a couple other times and hope to have him back many more times as we get close and get you set for 2018. And of course, before we hit fall camp, there's going to be ACC football media days at the end of uh, July. It'll be interesting to see what Mark Richt and uh, whatever players he has selected to join him in Charlotte will have to say about uh, the 2018 Canes. Uh, also want to do a bit of a reset because if you've joined me uh, for the first time or maybe come across a few of my videos here and there, but joining us for the first time on a live stream, this is Mark Rogers TV. We are the voice of college football. We bring you on a consistent basis. Look through the videos. Best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry across the board, all the conferences, all the Power Five, all the big programs. And uh, you also... 
uh, for an added extra benefit, get some analysis from myself as well. Uh, recently, I've knocked down the uh, top 10 non-conference games in college football for 2018. I've knocked out all the under-the-radar games for the first four weeks of the season, all the non-conference games there that you want to look out for. Uh, I've ranked the top 10 quarterbacks and running backs in the country. I've ranked uh, the top five uh, in the SEC at quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, and the ACC at quarterback, running back, wide receiver, on and on and on. We've got team reports like that. We have the one here with uh, Dwayne in Miami all over the place from all the major conferences. Pretty soon I'm going to be, I've got papers printed all over the place with schedules. I'm going to rank all the Power 5 schedules and all the independents, 71 all the way up to number one to let you know who's got the toughest and who's got the weakest schedules. And then I'm going to, Dwayne, uh, I, I may uh, pay the price for promising this, but rank all the teams and uh, give you previews and predictions on everyone. Ooh. So just want to let you know that. And for the 59 people that are watching us right now and for the five or 10 that were watching the first five or 10 minutes, again, with these live streams, uh, the notification I sent out earlier in the day and people tended to trickle in and uh, finally catch up with us. So what you do is if you missed five or 10 minutes or more than that at this point, uh, just wait till we're done. Watch the rest of the show. Wait till we're done, and within a couple minutes, it's going to process and post to YouTube, and then you can go back and watch the beginning and catch up with what you missed. If there are any really good comments or questions out there that I missed, what basically happens is every so often this uh, chat will reset, and I won't be able to go all the way up to the top, and obviously you guys are firing off all sorts of comments and questions, so you guys know, you regulars know that I try to get to as many good comments and questions as I can, uh, both to these live streams and to the videos but uh, if I miss you, we appreciate you being here. Appreciate uh, the support. Uh, we've talked about this uh, as well, Dwayne. What uh, could possibly hold this football team back? Because when I look at the schedule, I see uh, a more talented football team week to week, except for the LSU game and the Florida State game. And those are toss-ups from a roster standpoint. I think Miami's better than Florida State. Um because they have more pieces in place that I that are known factors for me than mm -hmm. Florida State still, still trying to decide uh, a few issues here and there. And they've been pretty porous along the offensive front. So that's going to have to be proven to me that they're going to be able to hold off the likes of some of the teams in the ACC on the defensive front side of the ball that they've had some issues with. Uh, and LSU obviously has premier talent, but not quite to the level they've been at for the last uh, 10 years or so. They're a bit thin in terms of a depth chart, but the frontline talent is exceptional. But new running back, quarterback, wide receiver, uh, number one guys at each position. It's going to be interesting to see if they're able to come out uh, fully. So when I look at the schedule, it's a very winnable schedule. They are by far the favorite in the division. You know, what's going to hold this team back? What, uh, what are you concerned about? Uh, well, you know, we, we alluded to this at the end of our last conversation last week. Um, and uh, the thing to me, the biggest thing to me, holding this team back uh, can be, because I don't, I don't think it will be, but it can be, theoretically speaking, is complacency. Uh, how do we as a program, how do we as a team handle uh, being patted on the back and being ranked in the top 15 starting a season? uh top top 20 top 15 starting the season uh how do we feel as though you know when you go to the acc media days and people say oh well you guys finally won the coastal you're, you've been the favorite for god knows how long since we've been there and we finally got over that hump it's technically the second time but it was the first appearance so that's the only one we really talk about um and how are we going to handle it uh, I personally think that Shaq Quarterman and Travis Homer will be our two guys at ACC Media Days. Uh, you know, a little friendly bet on that one there, Mark. Um, but uh, I think this team saw, because majority of the guys on offense and defense come back, believe we lost less than 10 guys as a whole on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, Trent Harris and Chad Thomas, Anthony Moten, R.J. McIntosh, Ken Norton, uh, Braxton Berrios on offense, Casey McDermott, Trevor Darling on offensive line, uh, Christopher Herndon at tight end, D. Delaney at, at corner. Uh, and I think that's it, 10 guys. I'll talk, if I missed anybody, please forgive me. Uh, 
But 10 guys off of a 22, 33-man roster who guys who were in rotation uh, over the last two years. So I think they saw how we played against Virginia Tech. They saw and played against Notre Dame. They saw what happened when we got big-headed and went to Pitt, uh, which is, I think, just like I talked about last time, could be our trap game, Boston College, a very similar situation. Uh, You're going into where a team might have nothing to lose and they just would love to embarrass you on national TV. Um, And I think that with them going through that and experiencing what it felt like to be undefeated and be defeated 0-3 going in, there's some things that Coach Mark Rick might not even have to say to these guys, or Manny Diaz might not even have to say, or or, or the offensive coordinator or, co- or Coach Ron Dugans or anything to motivate these guys because they've seen and experienced what it's like to be up there. We were never, you know, on top, never number one, but we were as high as number two. So self motivation is a key thing with this team, and it can go either way. You know, do if we lose or if there's an unfortunate loss to LSU, can we pull things together and finish the rest of the season out? Or, or if there's an unfortunate loss to Tallahassee, which will not happen, will not happen. Just want that out there. We're not losing to them. <laughs> uh, yeah, you we, don't want to get into that habit again. That went on for a while. Oh, my goodness. And then we'll have the next three or four game losing streak. Uh, we're not even going to talk about that. So, uh just being able to get, keep our mindset at a championship level every day of, and practicing and really showing up on game day, that's a big thing to me. I think there were way too many close games last year when on paper we were a lot better than those guys and we did not show it. We won the games, majority of them, but a lot of them were just too close for, for our liking. So I'm trying to keep up with all this. Uh, Lance makes a good point. Uh, just a correction here. The game is at Hard Rock this year against FSU. Also, uh, what's reflected here by Andres and a number of people about self-motivation. So you took it in a direction at first, uh, Dwayne, in regards to uh, this team being big-headed because of what they were able to do last year, accomplished uh, quite a bit early in the season, got off to the big start. But I like where you brought it at the end. There shouldn't be an issue with motivation. Uh, right. This this team was humbled against a very marginal pit team that was like a top 60 or 70 team. Then in the ACC championship game, Clemson showed that there's still a large gap between the two teams. Now, again, I've said this before, and I completely will back this statement. It can't be proven, but obviously it to a set to an extent, it can be proven by looking at the results of the rest of the games between Clemson and Miami. If they play 10 times. Clemson's not going out there beating Miami last season 38 to 3 every time they played, or otherwise Clemson would be doing the same thing to Louisville and North Carolina State and all these other teams they played. Florida State, they had a good game against them. So it was a perfect storm of Miami showing up playing like a D game and Clemson showing up probably playing like an A minus game. And that's the result. But they're probably two touchdowns better, or at least were last season. So they should see that gap between them and and Clemson. Then, of course, the Orange Bowl performance where they looked really good for a quarter and a half, and let it slip away, got away from DJ Dallas on offense, and then on defense, of course, uh, were dominating early, and then uh, Malik Rozier had the pick uh, when uh, the um, defensive lineman uh, on the left side, the D-end, uh, made a tremendous play for Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dwayne, somebody brings up the running back situation. I think another big point here is, and I'll liken it to the wide receiver position from this standpoint, you guys, once Mark Walton went down, you guys were considered to be extremely thin at running back. Now you may be in a position where you're pretty well fortified. Travis Homer had a nice season last year. As we mentioned, DJ Dallas probably should have gotten more touches, and I know a lot of Kings fans are really excited to see DJ Dallas this year. Lorenzo Lingard, of course, you talk about excitement. And then Mm -hmm. you mentioned Cameron Davis. So does Cameron Davis not factor into it just because he's late to the party, uh, just getting to campus now where uh, Lorenzo Lingard, I believe, played in the spring? 
Because basically, not. when when people see number one rated running back in the country, which Lingard was, or number two, rate, depending on your service, they mm -hmm. automatically think that guy is definitely better than the guy that's a lowly number seven in the country. <laughs> <laughs> You got to realize these are rankings. The seventh best guy in the nation, that's just an estimation. That's just a scouting report. And the best, these guys are one and one A. They could go either way. Uh -huh. uh, you could bring in a guy that's a 30th at his position, and they're still top caliber athletes. So I think we get hung up a little bit on that, where everything's thrown at Lingard as being the next guy at running back versus Cameron Davis. And a couple people commented on here that based on what they've seen, they actually like Davis better than Lingard. Whoa. Okay. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I, I can see where they're coming from with that because – Davis played down here in, in Dade County against some of the best talent in the nation. Not some of the best talent in the country, in the world. When it comes to football, Broward County, uh, Dade and Broward County, South Florida, that little section right there is the best. It's the most uh, plentiful athletes. And he dominated some games. He is a big boy. Big wide, you know, he's not, he's 5'11 in height and stature, but he's 225, 230, and he's a built 230. Um, and when he had big games against Miami Northwestern on national TV, uh, he showed up. Uh, when he went to state, I believe it was two years ago, he had a very big game and won the state championship uh, with, with Carroll City. Cameron Davis is a guy who I like that no one's talking about him. I appreciate that. Thank you. Because he's from the crib. And when you don't give us the respect due, it's, it's when we get an opportunity, we're going to show up. Um, he might be a secret weapon that we, you know, kind of keeping on the on the hush uh, as, as a guy who they don't really know what to expect when he gets the ball because Lingard has been getting, you know, a couple of carries and Travis – uh, Homer's getting a couple carries and DJ Dallas is getting a couple carries. Then this guy comes in who, you know, who's this guy, Cam Davis and boom, he runs you over. You know, <laughs> he is, um, our balanced guy. He's fast. He's thick. He's strong. Just like Lingard might be a little faster than Lorenzo Lingard. If you know, that might be surprising to some Travis Holman, Travis Homer is the guy, he's my guy. I met him a couple of times. Uh, he's a really, really good guy. And DJ Dallas is just a jack of all trades. Uh, so to answer your question, I think Cam Davis will be that underrated. He might get a couple, maybe two, 300 yards, uh, if that. He might have a couple of touchdowns here and there. Uh, but I think he'll be a secret weapon. Might even be a special teams ace for us in a couple of, in a pinch or two. So, of course, we're on the line with Dwayne Holloway. He's the wholesome one. Please join his YouTube channel for Miami football coverage. And uh, either uh, Alonzo1219 is still on the chat or maybe he's left us, but uh, just want to give props to him as well. Of course, uh, one of the very best uh, at breaking down Miami football and uh, keeping it real here on YouTube. And uh, please follow both of them on Twitter as well. I'm Mark Rogers, Mark Rogers TV. We are the voice of college football, trying to bring everyone together to uh, break down the game we love. And I uh, want to let you know, since we do have Zoe on the line, it reminds me we've got a contest going, courtesy of Alonzo1219. So please subscribe to his YouTube channel. If you're on here listening to Miami Football Talk, you've got to go and check out Alonzo1219 as well as the wholesome one uh, as well. But uh, the contest is you bring the most subscribers to Mark Rogers TV before July 15th. And the contest started June 15th. And we don't have anyone breaking out with a huge lead. So you're still in the running. Mm -hmm. Bring the most subs to Mark Rogers TV before July 15th. And uh, you get some serious good looking swag from uh, Alonzo1219, which could be a shirt, a hat, or you got to check out his videos where he's wearing the chains and it looks really good. And one of those <laughs> are up to be given away. So we appreciate Zoe for uh, helping us out there. Uh, Dwayne, I don't know what else is on your mind concerning this football team. So we're looking at, uh, wow, this is the second day of July. We are less than a month away from actual football battle for positions, uh, getting reports out of training camp, uh, trying to determine who's winning those uh, positional battles. Are, are there any 
positions that you find to be up for grabs right now that you're not real sure who could win? Or is it pretty well locked down on both sides of the ball? Well, I believe at any any position is definitely up for grabs. That's what makes uh, greatness if you have some competition out there. Um, just like I spoke about earlier with Demetrius Jackson, um, allegedly fighting behind both Joe Jackson and Jonathan Garvin, who are two monsters of men, um, that, that would be a, a battle that I can see week to week. Maybe Demetrius can get in a couple of starting, if not start the LSU game because he's a hardworking, uh, hard hat type of guy, show up in big games, uh, TFL sacks type guy. Um, and another guy who I want to talk about fighting for an opportunity is Scott Patchett, man. Scott is a guy from IMG Academy, pure pass rusher. I mean, he can get after the run also. But this guy just hasn't been able to get his opportunity out there, and I can't wait for him to get the opportunity uh, because I know for a fact you cannot say a guy isn't worth something if you don't put him out there and see what he can do, especially um, you know on our pass rushdowns, our NASCAR packages, and maybe even uh, against the Savannah States and the FIUs. Get out there and show us what you got, Scott, man. I'm rooting for you. Um, defensive tackle. Let's talk defensive tackle because I think a lot of people with the departure of 7 and 80, which is Kendrick Norton and R.J. McIntosh, uh, they think we don't have interior guys that can play. But Pat Bethel uh, had two and a half sacks in a strip sack against uh, Duke last year. Jonathan Ford is a uh, – Big six foot six, two hundred and eighty five pound guy who can play the one and the three technique that I alluded to with Alonzo one two one nine on his channel uh, could be a clone of R.J. McIntosh. Uh, and then you can't forget the guy who's wearing the stick. I haven't seen a defensive tackle wear number one in a long time. Mm -hmm. Nesta Silvera, um, the 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 guy, the founder of hashtag Make the Crib Great. <laughs> he is a dog, a monster that plays with amazing leverage, aggressive hands. And he has that Warren Sapp mindset, man, to where it's like, although I'm six one and a half, six two, I'm blowing you up and embarrassing you in front of your mama. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that mindset. Um, a couple of guys who I think are fighting for opportunities, uh, Mike Smith, red shirt senior. Uh, got in. He's the backup behind Shaq Quarterman as our inside linebacker. He got in and made some plays for us last year. Uh, was a dynamic pass rusher in high school. Wish they would have left him there, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Bradley Jennings, a rising sophomore, hard-hitting guy, uh, wears 44 for us. Keep an eye out for him. And uh, DeAndre Wilder, number 11, also from – Carroll City was on that state championship team with Cam Davis uh, as a as a weak side linebacker, our cover guy, good open field tackler, and a very good cover guy. The secondary, Mark, the secondary. Oh, like, with stars everywhere. You're feeling good about that. Oh, man. You know, we might be in that conversation for DBU again. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm still getting between you all at Ohio State and LSU. No, LSU is dropping back. At oh, least right yeah, now, right now. They're still really good, but they're a bit thin in the secondary. It's kind of kind of uh interesting. That's well, that's a good thing for us coming up. This, this year. Yeah. And uh, you know, our starters, Jaquan Johnson, who is a top five according to uh top five, top ten according to the top one hundred that we spoke about from uh, Sports Illustrated, uh players in the country, one of the best safety especially last year when he got snubbed for that guy, Derwin James. Oh, my God. But Jaquan Johnson made more plays than Derwin James. But, you know, guess because you're 5'11", you don't get the same love as a six foot two and a half Sean Taylor wannabe. Um, Shedrick Wedwine is, a, is our other safety. We can rock and roll those guys. But uh, a couple of names to keep an ear out for. Yep. Uh, Derek Smith, number 25. 
Got in a couple times last year against uh, Virginia Tech, Wisconsin. He's our nickel. He's a bigger DB, so he can play our nickel. He can play our uh, weak side linebacker, our new Viper position, and our four-two-five, and he can play the strong safety. Um, and Gervin Hall, Gervin Hall will be wearing twenty-six here, and they have been raving. He got hurt in the spring, so uh, his very first practice. Mark Rick said, I haven't seen a guy go from the, the near side hash mark to the far side hash mark and make a play here in a very long time. Uh, and and Gervin Hall is, is a speedster, and he's a ball hawker also. And uh, the hard hitter, Amari Carter, I think you might remember that one, against yep. uh, Bethune-Cookman, beautiful – able to turn his head and put the shoulder in. It was, it was a, even though it was Bethune Cookman, but it was a beautiful uh, sight to see the Canes doing that again. Um, and the battle between Mike Jackson and Trajan Bandy, uh, whether we're going to trust Bandy on that island or in the nickel, that's up to Manny Diaz to see what he does with that. Um, DJ Ivy, four-star freshman. This guy is an Artie Burns clone. Remember I said that. Artie Burns clone. Who's with the Steelers right now. Yes, yes. Who had a kind of a tough first six weeks in the NFL, but over the last year and a half has really turned the corner. A lot of rookie defensive backs got baptized in the NFL when they first showed up because they realized that everybody that they face every week can throw a ball in a window. Even the what we think are bad quarterbacks in the NFL can throw it in a window uh, that's just remarkable <laughs> yeah and yeah. it's timely too you know you could be just yeah. coming out of your break yeah and you don't even notice you know the ball has already been thrown now you have to adjust to tackling uh the guy des bryant kind of did him in but ever since then he's gotten much better and uh you know much respect to Artie burns he also made the number one actually number two corner on my top five uh, at every position over the last 10 years on my series on my channel. Check it out to see who got number one. I love those kind of series. Anytime uh, anybody delves into the history and they start doing rankings, I'm a sucker for rankings and ratings and lists, and I'm a sucker for the history of college football. I could probably set up a YouTube channel just on the history of college football and just talk about old games and players and that sort of thing. I love it. Going to do a quick reset here, just to let everyone know, Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. If you're stumbling across us for the first time, or maybe you've seen a few videos, but you have yet to subscribe, you want to get set for the 2018 season, all college football, all right here with guys like the Wholesome One right here, best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the industry. I don't know why you wouldn't subscribe. Do it right here. Go to the Wholesome One's channel as well. There it is. It's flashing the U, giving it to yes, you. Lord. You got to bring it that way to the Wholesome One and subscribe to his YouTube channel. And anytime I bring up Miami football, I got to go to Zoe's channel as well, Alonzo1219. And, uh, you know, I also, while I'm giving props uh, uh, in regards to Miami football, Cam Underwood comes on my show, and he's been doing it for like four years, and he does a great job at uh, the State of the U. Uh, I see some names here giving me props, and I appreciate it, and it just surprises me because I haven't seen these names before. But uh, Bren Nelson, thank you so much for uh, – he says, I love that I stumbled on you. Yeah. And uh, we are too. We appreciate great it. Great work. So <laughs> we, we appreciate that, Bren. And uh, Bren chiming in with, in with some great comments and questions as well. I don't know, Dwayne, personally, what we're going to do after the LSU Miami game because I'm going to be set up with my live stream. I'm sure you're going to be set up with your live stream. I'm sure Zoe's going to be set up with his live stream. And uh, of course, I will be let, letting people know that definitely you two will have the best live streams going, whatever you guys are going to do after LSU Miami. But this chat blows up every time I, I jump on here, especially if I'm talking Miami football. And mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen after that game. It's going to be <laughs> nuts. It's going to be crazy. Uh, we'll probably all be able to be on for 12 hours talking about it, whether good or bad. Either people are going to be going crazy saying they're the best, you're going to win the national championship, or they're <laughs> going to be down in the dumps and depressed. It's going to be one or the other. Yeah, most definitely. And if it's if it's a, a loss for uh, LSU, I mean, I don't know how they're going to take it. I mean, they even come on my channel, SCC, SCC, you know, we're going to, you know, blow you guys out and, 
Trust me, I, I 100% understand. I respect it. Love your team to the utmost. Because when it comes to this you, trust me, we love it to the death. <laughs> College football is just the best. Uh, people love their teams, and they love their teams in any sport. But uh, there's just something about the history, the tradition, the pageantry, the trash talking, the allegiance that college football fans have. You know, sometimes you'll see in the NBA where somebody loves the Warriors. Well, they didn't love the Warriors 10 years ago. Right. They were a right. Knicks fan or a Lakers fan or a Spurs fan or somebody else, and guys switch teams, and boom. They're Warriors right. fans now or whatever. And that's fine. We, we we all have the right to do whatever we want. Now, mm -hmm. I stick to my teams regardless, pro and college, but I'm just that kind of fan. Uh, but uh, nobody's jumping around to college football teams. Man, you have been a Miami guy since the day you watched a college football game, and that's typically the way it is for most of us. Uh, mm -hmm. College football is just uh, – it means something. It, it's it, serious. It means a lot to us. Uh, I actually have a – a special connection to the University of Miami. Uh, my father helped deliver me, and uh, he had on a University of Miami T-shirt. I was born June 29th, 1996. We weren't the best teams in, you know, the mid 90s. We kind of pulled it together towards the late 90s and the early 2000s. But you know, those Tallahassee guys were dominating. You know, after we won in 91, 92, we kind of had that drop off in the middle of 93 to 97, 98. And oh, they, that 94 team was pretty good. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. winning the national championship again. Yeah, we should have. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, 95 through 98 until that Edger and James game against UCLA. Right. Yeah, against UCLA. We weren't, we weren't um, you know, what we used to be. Um and that's fine because we're in that type of stage now, yet again, where the rebuilding opportunity, the recruiting and recruiting the right guys to build the program up is what we're, we're at now. But, you know, back to the story. So um, it was videoed. So then when I saw it in high school, you know, because my dad is always like, man, you, you wear these Miami wristbands every day or, you know, something Miami. I said, dad, it's it's. And I graduated in 2014. We hadn't won 10 games since 2004. So I was repping them and going back and forth with the uh, Florida fans because Tebow and Winky, uh, not, yeah, maybe, what, what was the quarterback before Tebow? Oh, at Florida, Chris Leak. Chris Leak, yeah. When those guys um, yep. were dominating. And then the early part of the 20 teen, uh, 2010s and teens, when Tallahassee and, uh, you know, Mr. Winston and those guys kind of bombarded us out of the way also. And uh, now we're coming along the latter part of the 20 teens into the 2020s. Um, and, you know, he said, man, why you love the Canes so much? I said, dad, what do you mean? It, he's a, you know, a, a hurricane fan, but I am a fanatic to the, you know, I could sit here and look up stats and watch film all day long. And it, it means nothing to me especially during the summertime before I go back to North Dakota State and I got to start doing work again. <laughs> um, but I got a chance to come across that video and saw, like, wow, the very first thing I see is my dad in this, you know, Ibis is a big Ibis in because in the 90s they wore the Ibis on the shirts. Um, it's big Ibis in the middle of his shirt and uh, it was a 91 national championship shirt in the back. Um, and that was the very first thing I saw. I'm also, uh, my cousin is Santana Moss, uh, so, and Sonoris Moss. So we are diehard Canes fans, you know, here in the Holloway Moss uh, family. So, yeah, we, we share uh, the same grandmother. So that's our connection there. That's very cool. Yeah. So we mentioned uh, a slide from 95 to 98. Uh, our guy Lance uh, mentioned that uh, he thought the 95 team was really good. And anytime anybody mentions something in college football history, I typically can uh, can can remember all the, the teams and off the top of my head. 95 wasn't really ringing a bell uh, for Miami. I, I don't know what Lance is referring to here. Yeah, the team was decent. It was good. Finished 20th in the country, 8-3. and three. 
but came out of the gate with a loss against UCLA, 31-8, to lost to Virginia Tech, 13-7, got blasted by Florida State. Of course, they were number one at this point in the season, 41-17, ran off a bunch of wins against, of course, at that point, it was the Big East, so a lot of Temple, Boston College, West Virginia, Rutgers, Pitt, those teams, and then finished with a win against Syracuse, who was ranked in the top 25, a 35-24 game. So 8-3, and three, no bowl game. Of course, uh, the uh, uh, NCAA suspension was in place uh, for that 95 team. So just taking us back there, I just uh, had to look that up and, uh, and uh, get straight on that 95 Miami team. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, anything else you've got in store on your channel coming up here in the next week? Yes, yes, I do. Uh, I took some time uh, after I did my top five at every position at the U in the last decade from 2008 through 2017. Uh, I did, like I said, every position, quarterback, wide receiver, running back. Um, it was so many athletes, and especially when we got to the wide receivers, when we got to the uh, cornerbacks and Inside linebacker was also a tough conversation to have as far as ranking them, um, you know, five, four, three, two, one, with a couple of honorable mentions in there uh, for freebies. Uh, that was my previous series, and I just completed that with the safeties um, this past weekend. Now I'm going to be moving to the top five teams in the last decade here at the University of Miami. Um, from 2008 to 2017, uh, and it is it has actually been a really good experience for me being able to go back and watch these games because I just did the players. Now let's talk about the team as a whole. Uh, where did they rank in offensive efficiency, defensive efficiency, first downs, third downs, key players on these teams? Um, and uh, I think people might – have an opinion of who they think number one is, uh, especially after the 10 and three season we just had. But another thing I'm going to weigh in there is who were on these teams. And uh, I'll give a little freebie now as an insight into the, into the series. Let's take the 2014 team who went six and six, but had eight players drafted. How does that happen? So you have to talk about, you know, who are on these teams and who are the guys uh, making plays for these teams. So it's going to be a very interesting series. Um, and uh, that's what I'm working on um, for the month of July. When we get into late July, early August, I'm going to be doing a uh, breakdown position by position and go in depth about every player on this roster. They either going to love me or hate me. <laughs> I'm going I'm going in depth on my guys, on my canes. All right. I'm going to be interested to see this series because, again, I am a, a sucker for lists, and especially when they come uh, have to do with historical lists. So in 2008, 7 and 6, 09, 9 and 4, a team that finished uh, number 19 in the country under Randy Shannon. Uh -huh. 2010, 7 and 6. 2011, six and six, 2012, seven and five, 2013, nine and four, 14 team went six and seven. If I remember, they played South Carolina in a bowl game. Yep. Uh, if I remember that correctly, 2015, eight and five, of course, that was the team that lost to Washington State in the uh, Sun Bowl with the snow flurries coming down. And then, of course, uh, 2016, the win over West Virginia, first bowl win in a long time that finished uh, 20th in the nation at 9-4. and four. And then, of course, last season's team at 10-3, and three, number 13 in the country when it was all said and done. Right. All right. Huh. You can, you can see the uh, there's a couple of 9-4 and four and 1-10-3. And, um, and record plays a huge part into the series. But sure. there's, there's also – you know, who was the offensive coordinator? What were some of the, the key uh, games that they may have won or lost that could have turned the season? Uh, I'm going to give every one of them uh, top five their own video. So, you know, number five will have their own 15-minute video. Number four have their own. That way I can properly give the depth and uh, respect to those guys on the team that's necessary. 
All right, the wholesome one joining us to talk uh, Miami football. Please join him at his YouTube channel for Miami Football Talk. And uh, another shout out to Alonzo1219. You got to subscribe to him as well. And, and please, if you love college football, and even if you just love Miami, this is kind of where I bring all these guys together right here. So between uh, Zoe, between the wholesome one, between Cam Underwood and a few others, uh, that I bring on here to talk Miami football. And if uh, you love Miami and you're entrenched in your team, you want to keep up with Florida State, Virginia Tech, uh, Clemson, and the rest of the ACC in the nation, you do it right here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. Uh, wholesome one, we appreciate you stopping by. You brought a whole lot of viewers and uh, comments and questions with you. So we appreciate it. Anybody on the chat that uh, we has a really good point, a really good suggestion, just leave it somewhere on one of the videos. I will pick up all the uh, comments and again any suggestions you have for comments or or for content i should say and any uh, suggestions you have for guests that you would like to see here at mark rogers tv certainly let me know who you want to see and we will break it down i believe i've got my slate full in terms of content i'm going to produce until the football gets kicked off for the first time that first weekend but if you've got anything like uh had a few suggestions for quarterback battles at usc clemson stanford i will do my best to get to those i knocked out usc i'll look at clemson and stanford as well here coming up in the next few weeks as we uh, go to uh, conference media days we're just two weeks away from the sec football media days uh and then it uh we no looking back from there uh we're going full throttle after that uh Dwayne, we appreciate you stopping by it's a great discussion each and every time sir no problem i truly appreciate it and uh you know one last uh you know cameo for me um uh, you know subscribe like check out my uh my channel and the spelling for that because wholesome is a little tricky it is h-o-l-s-u-m one, the number one, all of that is together. Holloway, H-O-L-L-O-W-A-Y, the U family. That's where I am, you know, in depth conversation about the University of Miami. That is my school. That is, you know, the place that I love. And as a Canes fan, why not bring the knowledge that I have of the game from a player and a fan perspective and a future coach's perspective to YouTube for you all to love. And I just want to say thank you so much, uh, Mark, for giving me opportunity. I've uh, been a long fan since 2014 when Cam used to come over here and be the only one representing us. I used to watch him uh, in a long time subscriber, over four years now, a uh, subscriber of yours. So You know, I didn't know that. 2014, yeah. and you're just now getting around to say hi. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I've been That's here. That's great. I appreciate it. Very, very long time. Uh, even when I had to sit here and, and some teams I didn't want to <laughs> hear about. But uh, one thing, when you're a college football fan, you know, a junkie like us, you want to hear, I don't know, it could be Washington State. It could be, uh, you know, UW. It could be Texas. I would love to sit down and listen and, and hear about it. I would also love to do a collab, you know, if we could do, uh, I could represent, when you talk about the ACC, you know, I can come on and talk Kane's football if you, you know, if that's an opportunity you wouldn't mind. Definitely. I, I'm uh, willing and able to do just about anything concerning uh, talking up college football. So you just, uh, we'll, we'll get something together on that. Uh, Lance, I want to make you uh, rest assured that we will bring back the wholesome one. He is coming back. Uh, Lance made that comment about four times. Bring him back, bring him back, bring him back. He's coming back. Uh, we're going to bring them back uh, to uh, break down the season and talk Miami. So don't worry about that. Sean, I see your suggestion on Florida football. I will reach out to one Jason Higdon as well. So thanks so much for the suggestions and the comments. We appreciate your support. And like the wholesome one will tell you, your comments, your subscription, your likes, it drives the search engine, the YouTube monstrosity that it is. Uh, it keeps track of all that data and it just helps us out to produce more content for you. And then obviously it's a boost for us. It inspires us to get your feedback and your suggestions and comments and all of that that uh, drives us to do even more for you. So we appreciate it. Uh, Dwayne, you have a great night and we will see you soon. No problem. Go Canes, baby. All right, everyone else, uh, keep in mind that, again, in two weeks, I expect to go to a um, set schedule for these live streams, but um, I won't be able to contain myself to just those live streams. We'll be doing all sorts of more live streams as well uh, with along the other content that we're going to provide you. So for another night, we will see you guys soon. 
enjoy the uh, July 4th holiday. And uh, we'll see you back uh, right here at Mark Rogers TV.